Thank you for your time. I hope you had a great afternoon. Um, my name is Cyril Cromwell, and it's my honor to be the moderator for the panel this uh, afternoon. So we're going to be talking back to the system, and we're going to be talking about what's been phrased as wicked problems. We're going to start with a definition of that, but in the interest of time, since we don't have too much left, we're going to move uh, right along. I'm going to kind of skim out on the bios. They are on page 12 of your programs if you're interested in learning a bit more about who's in front of us today. We have a great selection of panelists here that come from a wide range of different areas of specialization in the sector. Um, I want us all to welcome warmly, uh, and we can applaud at the end, Dr. Naomi Nichols. We're going to also welcome uh, Melanie Rose Fepier. We're also going to welcome Stephen Berrieco. And we're going to welcome Jim uh, Rankin. A round of applause, please. So in discussing wicked problems, we were looking at troubles, some problems, some issues that um, are often hard to identify, hard to peg down, and sometimes hard to create solutions for and to get on the same page. And so I'm going to start with the first question. And the first question is going to ask our panelists to think about how they encounter wicked problems in their own practice as it relates to youth well-being. So let's get started. Um, Naomi, would you mind starting? I'd love to. So before I moved to Quebec, not that long ago, it's so good to be back, um, I worked for a number of years with a youth-serving organization in this community, Jane and Finch, called PEACH, or Promoting Education and Community Health. There's some peaches in the audience. Over the last years, we have been working on a youth participatory research project together. And the project was inspired by one of the central findings of the report on the roots of youth violence. And it was also inspired by the community's concern that that report didn't get taken up in ways that they wanted to see happen. And so, so we took up one finding, and it was the finding that youth violence is more common among young people who feel disconnected from and discriminated against in the dominant institutions in their lives. So our research began with a shared suspicion that institutional processes for promoting school and community safety, for example, exclusionary school discipline processes and the proactive relocation or movement of young people across the education system, actually produce conditions of unsafety and exclusion for young people who have been deemed by the system to be at risk. We wanted to shine a light on all the ways that the system itself was implicated in the problems that it was simultaneously trying to solve, in this case, the problem of school safety. The research began with a focus on schooling, but young people quickly let us know that we couldn't understand anything about what was going on in schools if we didn't understand what was going on in their neighborhoods in terms of their interactions with the police. And once we started to track young people's interactions with the police, we could see that these interactions were also shaped by and shaping young people's experiences of housing need. Further, and I think this is most problematic for young people's senses of belonging and inclusion in public spaces and institutions, and despite the color and class-blind discourses and techniques of evidence-based policy and practice employed across the public sphere, the distribution of public sector resources and punishments and young people's experiences and observations of these things clearly reflected race and class-based patterns of discrimination. It is, as Desmond Cole reminded us this week in the Toronto Star, about outcomes, not intentions. These outcomes shaped a belief among the young people that we were working with that they were targeted by the police because they were poor and because they weren't white. This belief dovetailed with a general sense that the state doesn't care about poor black youth. Young people carry this knowledge into the hallways and classrooms of Ontario public schools, where school police resource officers and cameras are increasingly common features of these settings also. And then they go home to community housing environments where they are subject to regular joint patrols between the community safety units and the police and investigative detentions made legal, but not just, through officers' use of the Highway Traffic Act. And finally, we could see that all of this stuff was happening against the ongoing threat of family homelessness, influenced by the combination of heavy policing in Toronto community housing environments and the evictions for cause policy under the Residential Tenancy Act, which makes um, 
think it's unsafe behavior. It's another sort of ambiguous expression. It's not that exactly. Cause for eviction in Ontario, human, uh, Ontario housing properties. The research makes it extraordinarily clear that when youth well-being is compromised in one setting, there are implications for young people in all of the other social and institutional contexts of their lives. That's my answer. Thank you so much. Melanie Rose. So in June, 36 First Nations, Métis, and Inuit youth from across Canada gathered in Manitoulin Island in order to discuss the practices and also the research on Indigenous education. We use a traditional consensus model in order to author a declaration, but also recommendations in order to facilitate learning for Indigenous youth. During my experience in Manitoulin Island, I was surrounded by 36 youth that had lived different experiences throughout their lives and within the education system. As a whole, we created a declaration that I believe will um, numerate several wicked problems within the system. The declaration says, we no longer need permission to practice our culture or to be successful in mainstream society. We need to feel safe and understood in all environments. We need to incorporate culture and language in our everyday lives. We need to take control of our education in a holistic model, one that fosters place-based, land-based, and play-based learning, one that fosters language emergence. Full support of mental health, physical wellness, arts, and leadership will facilitate healing and help our nations grow through the celebration and co-creation of our next generation's youth. This call to action is not something we want to change, but it's something that we need to change in order to facilitate learning for Indigenous youth. I will now take the time to read a couple of stories from the 36 Indigenous youth and their experiences within the education system. Callie Eagle Speaker expresses, a wicked problem I've come across through my secondary education is the lack of care when it came to my Blackfoot language classes. Our books were in horrible conditions. We had to try printing them ourselves, but our core classes were offered new books every year and they were barely used. Also, Smudging was banned in our schools because there were complaints about the odor. Also, I have an anonymous speaker express. The last residential school in my community was closed in 1996, the year I was born. It angers me when people talk about residential schools as a thing of the past because it existed in my lifetime and would have been my reality if I would have been born a couple years later. Canadian citizens need to acknowledge that these problems are present problems and not problems of the past. As you can see, the lack of knowledge and understanding is still a big issue when it comes to Indigenous culture in the education system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Cool. Um, Great, great presentations, really, really hard for me to follow that. My name's Stephen, uh, just to give some context, I'm from London in, in the UK, so really glad to be here, thanks to Uzo and the team. Um, so I think the wicked problem that, that I wanna set out is just one very simple of, you know, how do we help people to access the social capital they need to be able to, to navigate systems, acquire the knowledge they need, access power, uh, and be able to kind of harness their, their lived experience and their insights to influence the system. Um, I started an initiative in London called Project Oracle a few years back, which is very similar to UFREX, actually, I think kind of uh, gave, gave some inspiration to, to the initiative, which was basically about working with the youth sector in London to also look at how it builds its approach to measuring uh, its social impact, how it builds evidence, and we tried to kind of influence both funders in that system, as well as organizations and academics, all with a view to how do we help organizations and the young people that they serve to be able to kind of have a seat around the table. So um, I think I'm really interested in, in this challenge, right? I think what happens is um, 
you know, we're, we're engaged in certain things, there's consultation, you know, sometimes there's, there's good enough examples of people maybe turning their lives around and being wheeled out as success stories, but are people truly getting access to, to power? You know, are people truly getting a place at the table and being able to influence policy and design and the spending of resources straight from the get-go? Or are people simply being consulted uh, once decisions are being made? And I think there's a real question about, you know, we can, we can try and turn systems around and, and tackle institutions, but actually, as individuals, as groups, as a movement, we need to build the social capital, the network, the skills, the knowledge to be able to kind of run around and, and create some mini revolutions and, and change the system uh, by, by stealth. So I think I'm really, really interested in, you know, we can, we can provide all the professional skills and insights that, that people need to be able to get on, but there's this thing which is kind of, you know, the, the softer side, right, that, that you learn maybe at home if, you, if you're brought up in a good environment or from good peers and mentors, but not everyone gets that. So how do we wrap that up uh, and, and share some of that social capital? Thank you very much. Jim, thank you. So Naomi, no, Naomi totally stole my, uh, my, my wicked idea. <laughs> uh, as a journalist, I've spent pretty much my whole career looking at uh, disproportionate outcomes for indigenous and, uh, and black youth, primarily, uh, through school suspensions, who's getting suspended, um, through carding, police carding, uh, child apprehensions, through incarceration rates, and uh, uh, use of segregation in jails. Um, just yesterday we heard from a commissioner who's looking into the Mother Risk uh, Commission, uh, the, the hair testing uh, lab at Sick Kids, and she told, uh, told the public for the first time that the tests were being used disproportionately on black and racialized parents. So how do you change these disproportionate outcomes is the wicked uh, challenge. And as a journalist, uh, we, uh, we try to uh, give a voice to the voiceless. And um, one way to, to make people care about things is to uh, be relentless and uh, never stop. Uh, so, you know, with, with an issue like carding, what makes people care about carding? Um, we heard about Desmond Cole. He made people care about it through a Toronto Life article. Uh, at, at the Star, we've been looking at um, police data for, well, since 1999, pretty much, uh, and we haven't stopped. And what it, what it does when you're relentless is it, it forces the issue and suddenly people start caring more about it. And, uh, but the real goal is to get policymakers to, to really care about it. And that means there has to be political will uh, to tackle an issue. And that means that they have to care about votes. And so how do, you, how do you make them care about votes? You have to make everyone care about the issue you're writing about. And which is a challenge when you're writing about uh, children in care. Um, by law, we can't identify them. We can't show their pictures. We can't hear them, we don't hear their voice, yet uh, they're our most vulnerable children. Um, so how do you give them a voice? Um, you, you, uh, you go out and seek out their stories and you tell them and you share them. Um, the same with uh, uh, incarceration. Who cares about inmates? Why should you care about inmates? Why should you care if, if uh, Adam Capay, uh, an indigenous guy out in Thunder Bay, has been, he's, he spent four years in, in uh, segregation awaiting trial. That's a hundred times longer than what the UN says is, is, is allowable and uh, tantamount to torture. Mm -hmm. So um, as a journalist, uh, we strive to tell these stories and uh, at uh, the Toronto Star, it's part of our DNA actually, we're supposed to go out and um, be the voice for the underdog and uh, been lucky enough to be part of that, uh, that uh, workplace. Thanks. Thank you very much. So I want to ask a follow-up question that's still in line with uh, addressing wicked problems before we move on to solutions, because that's the second part. Now, addressing wicked problems, what are ways that we can unearth wicked problems? What are some ways that we can identify them and then use that charged energy or to advocate for more charged energy in your specific example? And Stephen, you brought up the idea of mini-revolution. I'd like you to maybe expand on that. I'm going to ask panelists to speak for maybe one or two minutes on responding to how we get charged up around the so-called wicked problems and how we identify them, especially when they're complex and sometimes multi-layered. Um, so one or two minutes, please. Yeah. Same order is fine. Sure. So, I mean, uh, you know, I think what, what, what I meant by, by mini-revolutions is just this idea of um, 
you know, I think the way that I've got involved in creating change is by, you know, trying to set up projects, trying to set up initiatives, and actually trying to kind of galvanize people to, to, to take up action, right? So Project Oracle in London was very much uh, an initiative about how can we help the youth sector to, to, to build its evidence base, build its approach to measuring its social impact so that, you know, it can get on an even footing with, with, with other organizations and other sectors uh, in, in the city. And so, I, you know, I think that what that led to was a number of organizations across the city, you know, uh, improving their social impact, improving their service. It also created space for them to have conversations with funders, with city level government. Um, and, you know, kind of four or five years later, you know, that initiative has actually created a whole space where, you know, the children and youth sector are constantly engaged, you know, constantly on the agenda, you know, constantly having those discussions. And, you know, I don't think that was an intention of uh, the city government in kind of funding me and supporting me to, to, to run that initiative. I think they just wanted to work out, you know, which were the best organizations they should spend their money on, right? Um, but kind of through stealth, we actually managed to kind of, you know, increase some power, uh, you know, increase some legitimacy and, and kind of help people to, to build their social capital. So, so yeah, I, you know, I just think it's about what, what people are doing day in, day out, um, and kind of trying to add that up. And this feels like it's, it's that kind of movement, right? This is a coming together of, of a bunch of people who are doing great work to, to, raise, to raise the game of this system. Thank you. Um, Naomi, what do you mean? So the first question around how do we identify these wicked social problems, I think there's a legacy of work, especially in places where I work, like universities, where we've taken really complex things and tried to reduce them into dehistoricized theories and models that really reduce the complexity that is in front of us so that we can manage it. And I don't think that that's done us much good. I actually think that's led us um, to be looking in tunnels rather than looking this way. And I think um, as we move forward, we need to do more sort of explosive looking, looking at how things are actually connected, connecting the dots sort of across time and space, connecting the dots historically. Like the work that Jim did to identify the disproportionality of outcomes across all of these different sectors absolutely guided the study that I did to try to figure out how these disproportionate outcomes are actually being produced. And so there's a piece that you had to do in order for me to know what to do next. There was a piece that had to come from an ongoing conversation on the ground with Peach. There was a piece that had to come from the incredible work that went into producing the, the review of the roots of youth violence. And I think we need to start getting over our own tiny empires and try to work across the empires or dissolve the empires entirely in order to actually um, produce knowledge that is, that is fulsome and useful and, and might support the kinds of revolutionary acts that Stephen pointed to. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. I believe in order to identify wicked problems within the indigenous education for youth, you need to go and ask youth what the problem actually is. <laughs> and that's exactly what Three Things Consulting did when they invited 36 youth from across Canada to come together and talk about the problems associated with Indigenous education because no one knows the problems better than those living them. And I believe that gave them the opportunity to get their voices heard, not only as a youth but as someone in the system themselves taking a huge part in the system. And if you listen to their voices and to what they really have to say, then problems can be resolved. However, if it's adults sitting at a table discussing what they believe the problem is, nothing will be achieved because those aren't the problems that are relating to Indigenous youth. So their voices need to be heard. Thank you. You stole my answer. Uh, <laughs> I should go first next time. Uh, as a journalist, it's about listening and, mm -hmm. uh, and listening to the people who are experiencing um, whatever it is that's happening. And just to, to go back to carding, which is street checks or the police stopping and questioning and documenting of mostly young people and putting their, their uh, details into a massive database. Um, you know, for years, uh, we were hearing about uh, anecdotal stories about uh, 
um, going back decades before I got involved in journalism about, you know, driving while black, uh, disproportionate treatment. It was all anecdotes. And so how do you, how do you get underneath that uh, and, and bring life to those stories and, uh, and give, give them a foundation that is unde undeniable? Uh, for, for us, it was getting the data. And, uh, and we did that through FOIs mm -hmm. and uh, a, lot of, a lot of legal fights. Um, the carding data took seven years to get it. Uh, and we were in court twice. Uh, it cost well over a million dollars, um, our, our former publisher has estimated, uh, in, in, in lawyers mainly, um, uh, to get uh, that data. We also got sued, a little, a little side story, $2.7 billion by the Toronto Police Association. Uh, so we had to defend ourselves against that. Um, but uh, the, the data, once we got it, uh, it, it, moved, it moved the discussion into the front uh, and allowed for, uh, it, it gave permission to people to talk about it uh, at the political level. And, and I mentioned Desmond Cole earlier. I, I still see him as the big tipping point where he got everyone to care about the issue, whereas the Toronto Star sort of built up this foundation uh, and then he tipped it over. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to move on to solutions now, and I'd like to ask the panelists to take maybe another three minutes to talk about how we might solve the issues that you've presented, that you've brought to the table. I'm wondering about what kind of things have to be in place in the system, what kind of things are requested or demanded from us as uh, people that are in the sector as well, and uh, I want to give people a heads up to think about reflections and questions, because we do want to take some audience questions. So if you're thinking about something, just remember some of the words that are being mentioned right now. This idea of stealth is very interesting, connecting the dots. Youth, um, in terms of representation, democracy, um, in terms of the sacrifice required, the years, the money, the fights, the struggles. And so how does that relate to our own work uh, amongst those that are in this room? So reflect on that, but let's get back to this question about how the panelists see solutions, and let's open up the dialogue. So we'll start with Jim. <laughs> I'm going to steal your idea here. I think. Uh, one of the great uh, recommendations that came out of the, the roots of Youth Violence Report by uh, McMurtry and, and Curling uh, was this concept of a, they didn't call it a youth czar, but essentially it called for um, someone to sort of have the power to sit up high and look at everything that affects youth mm -hmm. and, and families, quite frankly and have the power, uh, uh, this would be a, not a political position, mm -hmm. be like a commissioner, uh, and th they would be able to get all the right stakeholders to the table to talk about uh, issues that impact uh, youth and families. And to me, they're, they're inseparable. It, it, and, and the solution is to, to invest early in, in both those areas, families and youth, and uh, it's actually financially smarter to do it that way too, because at the end, if you don't take care of your neighbor, uh, you end up spending more on health care, you end up spending more uh, on, on um, the criminal justice system, jails, uh, you name it, and it's way more expensive. Every cost-benefit analysis that I've seen uh, mm -hmm. sees investing early as, as the way to go. And, and uh, why aren't we doing that? It's because it's tied to political cycles. Mm -hmm. uh, we elect a premier, they're, they're here for one or two terms, um, and then they're gone. And, and it's, they're not going to get a lot of political coin out of uh, saying, I'm going to appoint a youth czar to, to make sure that this is going to be a sustained, funded kind of effort, that uh, there will be a mandate and, and they will take care of children and, and the families. Instead, what we have is a cycle where you promise a bunch of stuff to the electorate, the election happens, some of it happens, and then you've got to promise more stuff the next time. Um, but this is an area that requires the, that kind of a, an approach, I think, where um, there's this powerful uh, apolitical body that can actually get all the right stakeholders to the same table. Uh, and it has to be, you gotta, you gotta break down all the silos. Mm -hmm. So you can't just have, here's education, uh, here's, here's uh, justice, and here's uh, healthcare. You have to get them all together and, and see it as a holistic kind of approach, and, and it should be that way. Um, but it means giving up your control of your silo and spreading the money around uh, where it's needed. So should we be spending X, X million dollars uh, to build a new jail, uh, or should we be spending that same amount of money in, in a, a neighborhood that uh, is at risk? Uh, so that's my thought for a solution. Thank you. Uh, Stephen. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I hope, I'm, I hope my, my, my concept is making sense. I'm looking at my list here, and I'm like, this looks all really theoretical. Um, but, but no, look, so five things that I think are kind of 
um, important in, in trying to, uh, you know, build movements like this, like Project Oracle, uh, that are about trying to kind of, you know, bring power back to, to, to young people or whoever it is you, you might be representing. So one, I think, you know, it's always important to think about things from the perspective of kind of top down and bottom up. Uh, and I know it's a bit crass, but basically, you know, uh, it's important to, to stay connected to front line, to what's going on on the ground, what's going on in communities, but it's also important to, to stay connected, uh, whether that's by, by choice or through legal routes, with what's going on at the top and what's going on with the flow of resources and, and power. And I think just making sure that you're thinking about top down, bottom up is, is, is really important. Uh, another thing, coming back to you know, that individual and how do you help individuals to, to build the social capital that they need, you know, yeah, I'm really interested in, you know, helping people get the professional skills they need. You know, that's the kind of stuff that, that I learned. You know, yes, there's a bit about peers and making sure that you're aligning and spending time with people that are trying to do the same things. But there's also a bit just about, like, your personal and your psychological development, right? You know, when you're going on these journeys, you know, you've got to be prepared for, for change and challenge. And, and there's a bit around that. So it's top down, bottom up, you know, your personal, professional and, and peer development. Uh, another thing is about incentives. So I think it's about understanding organizational incentives, right? If you want to create a movement like Euphrex, you know, what kind of incentives do you need to tap into to, to be able to, to get people to come on board uh, and, and get involved? And then again, you know, uh, a bit controversial here, I think it's also about understanding people's own self-interests, you know, like, yeah, we are here and we're doing some good, but sometimes people are also interested in themselves, right? And trying to like build their careers or build their skill set or learn and, and grow and develop. And I think it's important to kind of get that on the table, understand what that looks like and, and be clear on that. And then the final thing I would say is, yeah, you know, I think there's just something about trying to create change through, through stealth, you know? I think absolutely there's a place for, you know, kind of loud revolutions and big institutional change but actually, that stuff comes after there's been a build-up, right? There's just been a build-up of things moving, changing, going in a different direction, and then finally kind of governments and society wake up and realize that, you know, they've got to move the dial. So, so those would be my, my points. Thank you very much, uh, Melanie Rose. So our first recommendation was the delivery of a mandatory training on cultural knowledge and also history for all Canadian teachers. So this can be done in several ways. First, by initializing a minimum credit hour requirement uh, for a selected indigenous-themed courses in post-secondary -sec schools for those wanting to be teachers or educators. Also, during their practicum or prior to becoming a teacher, they can do a review of an online module in which uh, personal experiences of the indigenous youth in their region will be shared via a video. There will also be teachings on history of Indigenous people and common problems facing Indigenous youth today. Upon finishing this um, module, they would have to do a questionnaire or a summary of what they have learned in order to complete their sensitiv sensitivity training. And secondly, we want a, to design a national core curriculum for all Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth. Students and teachers still believe in some stereotypes when it comes to Indigenous youth because of the lack of knowledge and understanding about our culture. As we know, these stereotypes can lead to bullying, a higher rate of dropouts, and also suicide in Indigenous cultures. Future generations of Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth should learn about the Indigenous culture and way of life. Students should be exposed to the present and past events that have affected Indigenous culture, as well as their way of seeing the world as a circular, holistic view instead of a linear path. With this knowledge, socioeconomic and cultural issues will decrease. We believe that the curriculum should include Indigenous history, treaty rights, the worldviews, inter intergenerational effects of residential school systems, cultural assimilation and genocide, but also the importance of mental, emotional, physical, and spiritual well-being in health and sexual education classes. Now I know how Jim feels. <laughs> 
So I guess I'd like to start by saying that we're all implicated in young people's well-being in this province. This means that we all have a role to play, and I want to pick up on some of the things you started us on, Jim, thinking about um, what that means for our accountabilities. Because I think we need to move beyond our individual institutional roles or how we see those accountabilities play out in the system. We must seek opportunities like this one to get in the room together and engage directly with one another across academic, government, community, and non-governmental organizations. Clearly, the media also matters within and beyond the youth sector. Bringing what we know individually into conversation with what others know that is different about the seemingly intractable social problems that we're trying to resolve, maybe together. But talking isn't going to solve anything. If we're actually committed to promoting youth well-being, we need to organize the system differently. So the talking is first, but it's just a first, or it's important, but it's a first move. And we need to reorganize the system very carefully. As the program of alignment between social housing and policing indicates, youth well-being is not necessarily the outcome of inter-institutional coordination. Sometimes young people are harmed under these sorts of initiatives. Rather, we need to pay attention to the outcomes of policies and practices that cut across sectors. I like the czar. Our ability to prioritize youth well-being requires that we critically examine how inter-institutional relations support or undermine young people's full and equal access to public resources and their inclusion in the public sphere. We also need to be prepared to move beyond our own institutional accountabilities, recognizing, for example, that as educators, we cannot purport to be advancing student success if young people's lives outside of school are organized to undermine this very outcome. To collectively work towards youth well-being in Ontario requires a voluntary loss of economic and organizational autonomy at the individual institutional level. We need to be able to account for an investment made in one sector, like education, which creates positive impacts in another sector, like youth justice or housing. A truly integrated approach to youth well-being requires similarly integrated and comprehensive methods for tracking the impacts of our interventions across connected government, policy, and service arenas. There are also going to be really important roles for young people to play. <laughs> We're seeing it here. <laughs> we need to ensure that all young people, everyone, has access to the intellectual tools that they need to engage in critical, social, political, and economic analysis. It is particularly important that we work with those young people that the mainstream education system has written off. For the last number of years, I've trained and worked with young people as youth researchers on different projects that I've led. And I always seek to hire those young people that the system has kicked out. Kids who've come out of jail, who've been kicked out of the school system, who are parenting, who are homeless. Those are the young people who have knowledge of the system that we need to pay attention to. Their knowledge has been invaluable to the projects that I lead and the sorts of findings that we're able to produce together. And I have faith that in their lives, some of them are going to contribute positively to processes of social and political transformation. But until the time when they are ready to take the reins, we, all of us in the room, are accountable to the young people who are in the system today and who are experiencing harm. We need to pay attention to the documented disproportionality of public sector resources and punishments across race, classed, gendered, and cultured lines. We know there are problems. We need to work with the very groups who experience the disproportionality of public sector punishments and exclusions to engage in equity-oriented, evidence-based policy and practice change with the knowledge that this isn't a one-time thing, but a long-term commitment to redressing historically situated patterns of inequality that have allowed some people like me, to benefit at the expense of other people's struggles. That's how we'll move forward. Thank you very much. In the spirit of this conversation, it seems that dialogue and breaking down silos is key, so I think we're kind of going to change the order a little bit and make sure we make enough time to hear from the audience. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you to start thinking about your questions now. I'm going to ask you to just have one question that's very direct to either all or um, a single panelist. 
Um, I'm going to ask our panelists to maybe take one minute to respond. Now, before we begin that, I hope you're generating ideas now. Um, I want to kind of return full circle and look at why we came here to this conversation. I'm going to read a piece of the um, outline uh, about t talking back to the system. So youth development is embedded in different interconnected and nested physical and social contexts. For example, family, peer, caregiver, teacher, school, community, religious institutions, social service, policy, and government. We've heard uh, practical examples of that today with our panelists. And I'd like us to kind of leave thinking about that and thinking about where our experiences also intersect with that. It continues, uh, no matter what our entry point into supporting youth well-being is, we engage with policies, relationships, resources, and power that make up this system. I want us to think about this, and now is a good time to start taking some questions so we can continue this conversation just for the next 10 minutes, because that's all we have left. So are there questions? I see a hand. Uh, we have a microphone, so we'll take that. Um, this is from one of your comments, Dr. Nichols, or if you like going you by Naomi. Naomi. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Um, so I think what I was picking up on is that one of the things that needs to happen is people need to be willing to give up some of what they have, some of their status. And I agree, and I personally struggle with it. I want to have nice things like trips and a, a, a satisfying standard of living, maybe move into a century-old home one time, you know, <laughs> for example. Um, but I, I really struggle with how, how is that going to happen? How do you make that happen um, in a way that people will buy into, like practical steps? Theoretically, I agree with you. I'm willing to give up a century-old home, I guess, and other, other things so that my salary is less, so that, that, that can be redistributed once I'm making a salary that would even be worth redistributing. Um, so, <laughs> so, yeah, I want to know really practically how, how do we make this happen? Oh, yeah. Thank you. Let's take more questions and then we'll just respond. Is there another question? Thank you for that. There's another question here. So my question was uh, related to Stephen, one of your comments earlier about the difference between the kinds of skills that are being provided or there's this thing about uh, what, are the, what are the softer skills that maybe some youth grow up uh, developing or learning or being able to have that maybe programs don't attend to. And one question that I had, um, because I believe that that's true, is in a, in a conference or the first day of all of us being together where people are thinking about measurement and evaluation. Um, I, one question I have is, are those things measurable? And it, you know, are those things measurable? Because often when we talk about resources and what's funded or what are people enabled to do, these are kind, kind of considerations that, uh, that organizations are faced with is that funders maybe don't always think about these things. And even if they do, you're not going to be able to always offer something. So I wondered if there were any thoughts from the panel about that. Thank you. Perhaps uh, two more questions? Uh, one and two. Uh, we have one person there. So I'm coming from the education sector. Um, and although we talk a lot about implementing uh, Indigenous education and focusing on Indigenous issues, um, I'll be very honest with you, as a supply teacher, uh, I've been asked to perpetuate um, very much, uh, very stereotypical images of indigenous peoples. Um, I've also been traumatized at OISE, um, to be honest with you, that they've quote unquote implemented Aboriginal teacher education, and yet I came out of that even more traumatized and not understanding um, myself as a settler here and how to teach um, people, whether they're indigenous or not, about indigenous peoples and issues. So I'm curious, even though we do talk about having these systems, um, I'm also seeing my peers perpetuating uh, oppressive systems. So I'm just, I'm like, I'm thinking, okay, we have this stuff out here, but we're not actually doing it. So I'm wondering if it's, uh, whether it's attitudes that are heavily entrenched that we're, are not changing, I also wonder, I also want to be mindful that, you know, 
only yourself can be the person that changes your attitude. So I'm just curious uh, what your thoughts are on that. Thank you. And the last question. It's a little bit of a backstory to this question. I work with a youth. He's doing really well now. He's in university. In the final year of high school, um, he got into an issue that was, there was a reasonable amount of trouble with it. Uh, I sat in on a meeting with a police officer and some of the school staff, some that were very fond of him, um, other ones that thought that he kind of smirked and got along. And one of the comments from the officer was, we've had, they had a documented amount of interactions with this youth, mainly because of issues with his friends, but he had been around. I think it said they had 15 issues with him and have not been able to pin one on him. That was the comment that was made, the idea of pinning it on him. Uh, the problem with it was when I spoke to him about it, he talked about sometimes how he kind of would laugh. He knew he did nothing wrong, so he would kind of, in front of his friends, joyously, not boast, but how do, so my question is, how do you think that that treatment and portrayal, and I'm talking to Naomi, Jim, to everybody actually, how do you think that treatment and portrayal, that negative kind of helps to, or not helps to, but negatively affects the students in, or, or the, the youth in where they kind of embellish this negative image of them. There's that old adage, everybody wants to be good at something and sometimes when you're always looked at negatively, you kind of embellish that. Or how do you think that that helps to continue this horrid cycle? Thank you very much. Uh, Jim, is that something you can speak to? Sure. Okay, so fortunately we have a question for all of our panelists. Um, so we'll start with, um, Naomi, um, so how do we balance having a personal life, having mm -hmm. entitlement in a sense to our own well-being, mm -hmm. and maybe you know, even aspirations of wealth, as well as community wealth? How do we balance those sometimes contesting forces? So the first thing is, I was actually speaking more at an institutional level, and I think institutionally, one of the things we do is we say, but we're doing everything right. I mean, I come from education, and we, we love kids, and we have an equity and a diversity strategy, and how can we be part of the problem? And so we do, at an institutional level, a lot of sort of blaming the other guy, and a lot of, well, I am accountable to the Education Act, and that stuff happens outside of my classroom, and so there's nothing I can do about it. And I think at that level, that's where we need to sort of get over ourselves and above ourselves and start thinking and acting outside of our particular institutional silos and accountabilities. But I think you also raise an important point about um, our commitments to uh, capitalist narratives more generally in society, and if you look at what's happening in the United States right now and the election campaign, people are voting for someone who does not work in their best interest. And I think that we've all bought into a narrative that isn't in any of our best interests. Capitalism requires relations of exploitation. It doesn't work unless there's someone else we can make money on the backs of. Right? So if we actually all commit to a redistribution of wealth and power, we're all going to benefit. I don't know if you're going to get that house. But what it means is that we all can actually sustain a, a, a more well, a weller, uh, a life that, that is of a higher quality for everyone. And so part of it is shifting how we're looking at and understanding, making sense of the problem and being a little more honest about who these, who the current relations actually serve. Because it's not most of us. And it's some people, and, and, and then even within that, there are people way less fortunate than us. Not even in Canada, it's elsewhere actually in a global economy where people are really being um, exploited and, and, and marginalized right now. And so I, I think that's why when I said part of this is around making sure young people have the tools to engage in critical social, political, and economic analysis, that's partly what I was getting at because they shouldn't be voting for Donald Trump. And they are, some people. And so if they actually understood how those relations are organized at a broader level, these would be, they'd be making different decisions. Thank you very much. Um, round of applause, that's great. I want to ask uh, Stephen a question. Are soft skills measurable, um, and how so? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, just just to come back on Naomi's point as well. I mean, you know, uh, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, and I think I think there is a place uh, for for capitalism, and I think there is a place for 
you know, profit with purpose and doing good, but actually entrepreneurialism uh, gave me the opportunities to be able to navigate out, out of my existence. So I think, I think there is a balance um, around some of that. Uh, can, you, can you measure uh, soft skills? Uh, very practically, you can, right? I'm, I'm vice chair of a charity back in the UK called Chance UK. Uh, it does mentoring for five to 11 year olds who are uh, child protection or children in care. And it's a 52 week program where a mentor is trained, spends one afternoon with them a week to, to basically support them to grow and develop and, 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 and build those soft skills. And what we do is we use a tool called the Rosenberg uh, Questionnaire, which is a, a tool, it's about 50 questions, which basically asks indirect questions to understand people's confidence levels, the, the child's confidence levels, uh, both pre-intervention, post-intervention, and then it's used periodically after. So, so very practically, you can. Uh, more generally, I think you know uh, there's, 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 there's a lot of benefit in qualitative and, and focus study approaches to understand how people have, have progressed uh, post an intervention. But, but I think the other thing I would say is that um, you know you, it's just it's just so important that that stuff. You know, I think it's 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 swept under the carpet. It's it's assumed, and actually, uh, you know, especially in this kind of globalized world where we're living today, it is so much about networks and your ability to communicate. And you know, I can't remember the academic, but there's an academic who looks at this concept of bonding social capital, where this is social capital that you build as you're growing within a community, and then bridging social capital. So your ability to be able to, to build bridges with other groups and, and other people that don't look like you or come from different backgrounds and be able to build social capital with them. So. Uh, you know, one, I think it's important, and two, it's very much measurable. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to, um, we can give a round of applause for that response as well. Excellent, thank you. Uh, for Melanie Rose, there was um, some comments on experiences within the education system of stereotypes living on. And the question is, how do we, like, make um, people relate or understand or have the will to actually change beyond just the tokenistic things that some educational institutions are plotting here and there. So if I understood your question right, is that you yourself have been through a sensitivity training about indigenous studies and came out of it still having questions about the indigenous culture and not feeling comfortable talking or um, teaching the indigenous culture. Okay, okay, and that's exactly one of the biggest problems is that there, there are already sensitive, sensitivity trainings across the country. However, some of them aren't the best, some are, but we need to col collaborate as a country and come up with a sensitivity training that works. And I believe that as an Indigenous student, if you were my teacher, even if the sensitivity training wasn't the best, you having the knowledge that you have now, even if it's just a little bit, you'll be able to understand us a little bit better. So if a student comes up to you and says, I have a problem with a certain aspect in my life, and that relates to maybe drugs or suicide or alcohol, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there's a reason because their grandpa, grandpa was in the residential school and that has affected generation through generation. So with that knowledge, yes, maybe you can't solve the problem for that ch child, but you can sympathize. And hopefully with the um, national core curriculum for generations to come, they will have learned about indigenous culture and the history. So going into post-secondary, they will already have that knowledge. And then it will just progress in that way and more people will have knowledge about our culture. We're not asking you to be experts on it, just to understand our points of view, if that explains a little bit. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, we have a question um, that Jim has graciously, graciously um, volunteered to take on. And this question is around this notion of secondary deviance. We've talked a little bit about the education uh, institution perpetuating stereotypes. Also in media, we're seeing these stereotypes. So how is that absorbed by uh, minds of all ages? And what do we do with that, especially when it comes to um, criminality and deviance and these types of stereotypes? 
Uh, the example you gave of the, the student is uh, it, it, it's it's the epitome of why carding is a bad idea. Um, that's what that young guy's been through. And uh, it, I recently wrote about another guy who had uh, more than 45, I think it was, contact cards. He doesn't have a criminal record. Uh, so if you're continually targeted uh, and the approach is, it goes like this, what's your name? What are you doing here? What's in your backpack? Um, where do you live? Uh, give me your ID. And that's how it goes. Uh, it, it's got to wear off on you after a while if it's happening continually. And, uh, and, and it's happening in certain neighborhoods more often than others. So it doesn't happen where I live, uh, to me, uh, uh, down in Leslieville. But it's, it's happening uh, in many parts of the city. And so if you're a young person going about your life, uh, going to the library, going to school, and this is happening to you, uh, you start to think, there is something wrong with me. Like, this, this is just the way it's going to be. And, and that's, I think, terribly harmful. And criminologists will tell you that uh, that doesn't increase safety in neighborhoods. Uh, <laughs> And, and it's a horrible thing. And you touched on the media stereotyping too, and, and absolutely, uh, you know, you get a f fed a steady diet of crime stories, and you see faces, and people start to think of everyone uh, as a criminal who looks a certain way, you know? And, and um, what, what needs to change is that you have to think about um, who it is you're, you're seeing across the room, or the police have to think about that approach. Uh, media has, has to think about uh, telling positive stories. Um, and not portraying people in stereotypical ways. Uh, those are the ways forward. And uh, with carding, um, I, I really am hopeful that it's going to change, that uh, going forward at the start of the new year, there will be new regulations, and police officers hopefully will, will, will think harder about why are they stopping this person, and, and the approach will hopefully be different, and it won't be as adversarial. And it won't be about, you know, the sole purpose is to get this person's information and put it into a database. So when, I, when, when there is trouble, I can say you're in here 15 mm -hmm. times. Thank you very much. A round of applause for all our panelists, please.